We are in this giant series uh, called Unstoppable, uh, and we've been taking a journey through the early church uh, and uh, through the book of Acts. Um, and it's been an extraordinary series. I hope you've been blessed. I hope if you've been tuning in, uh, you've learned something uh, through these few months um, or even longer uh, that this series has been going on. Um, this morning as we begin, I, I've been mulling over something, and I don't know whether you agree with me, but I think in 2021, there's something that we have in, in greater supply than we have ever had in the history of mankind. It's growing increasingly every single day. It's not going to stop. Um, there's nothing we can do to stop it, and it's, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And I'm not talking about anything COVID-related. I'm talking about information. We are swimming in it. It is flowing out of our ears. Quite frankly, it is flowing in our ears, and there's, way, you know, there's a lot of it. And don't get me wrong, I think information has done us a lot of good. Um, you know, because of the amount of information we have today, uh, we're able to make, let's say, more informed choices as consumers when we buy something uh, online. You know, I was alive at the time where, when, you know, say I was in the market for a pair of earphones, I would walk into an electronic store, you know, you know earphones, right? You, the things that, you know, the, the wires, you remember those? Um, and I would, I would walk into a store and ask the guy or whoever, I'm, can I buy some earphones? He would show me three or four options, you know, you, you pick one, you go to the counter, you pay with cash, you know, you remember that, um, and, and then boom, I have a spanking new pair of earphones. Today, if I want to buy a pair of earphones, I feel compelled to compare across Shopee, Lazada, secondhand on Carousel, Amazon Prime, the actual merchant, discount stores, aggregators, and two hours of research later, I'm not even sure whether I know what pair of earphones I want than before I began, and now I've put my car down for a coffee machine, like, well, how did I get here, you know what I mean? It, that's the kind of, and if you've ever heard of the term analysis paralysis, I feel like that's a condition that plagues us every single day. Yeah? Um, but, 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 uh, but, but information, I think, has done us a lot of good, even though there are areas where it can be very challenging and, and stressful. You know, you, you're able to um, look up customer reviews of a restaurant before you dine there, you know, of a hotel uh, before you go and stay. You know, if you want a question answered, you're a few clicks away from figuring out when World War II began. Um, you can learn just about any skill you like, however remote uh, that you want, with high-quality content online that's completely free. Yeah, and never in history has, has it been this way. Um, but I think it can also be very challenging and very stressful, and I think it actually, it's actually a lot worse than what I'm describing. I think in many ways, information has perhaps broken us, it perhaps has, has, has debilitated um, us as a human race, because with information comes the possibility of counter-information, comes the possibility of misinformation, Right? We used to say to ourselves, we only trust information from reputable, trustworthy sources. What does that even mean anymore? I'm told constantly, you can't trust the government, you can't trust leadership, you can't trust for-profit companies, you can't trust non-profit companies, you can't trust the church. And where, where are you hearing all these things? Just open your eyes, it's plastered all over the news. By the way, are you reading the news? Can't trust that either, because it's the press. They have their agenda, right? I was, I was alive at a time, a lot of these I was alive at the time makes me feel really old, but I was alive at a time where fake news wouldn't have been a term that even made any sense. And, and now, it's like you can't trust the press. You, you, whatever you read in the news, take it with a bucket full of salt. Do your own research. Do your own background checks before you decide anything. Where are you doing your research? Google, can't trust that, because they, they show you what the advertisers want you to see, not what really is the truth. And on and on it goes. And it's downright frustrating. I don't know about you, but at some point, amidst all of this information, I, I don't know what your approach is, but I'll tell you what mine has been. Mine has been, honestly, to just withdraw. I just say to myself, you know what? Everybody else can keep on fighting. Everybody else can keep on commenting on social media however much you like. I will use my very limited time, attention, energy, psychological health, my mental capacity, living life as I remember it's supposed to be enjoyed because it's driving me crazy. I don't know whether that's, that's your approach. Maybe that's how you feel right online right now. But I, my approach has just been to sort of check out and withdraw. But the issue comes, I think, when you can't withdraw. What happens when you're not able to just turn off your phone and delete Facebook and, and just, just step out of the way? Because it's not just about theoretical information. Maybe decisions have to be made, actual choices, are at stake. And you need to find a way forward. You need to find a path forward. What then do you do? In those moments, what would you consider is the right information? What is the right answer? 
How do you figure out, and, and as Christ followers, what should we focus on? What should guide us and what is our responsibility to help us make a way forward amidst all of this information, amidst all of this divide? That's kind of the question that I've been thinking about as I studied for uh, this week. And the good news is, long before smartphones and Google and Pofma, and way before the dawn of the information age, a handful of Jesus followers were struggling with very similar things. And I think if we look at how the story unfolds today, we'll get a bit of insight into what that means for us as well, and perhaps maybe a secret into figuring out how to deal with all this information. So as we dive into the Word of God, let me just open up the rest of the time that we have uh, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every person that's gathered here and gathered online. I know that it is by no accident that um, they are here or they are watching. Um, I pray that you give us open hearts and open ears and open eyes to see you, to hear from you, um, and primarily and only from you. And may this word go forth um, and go deep for somebody or some people um, that you want to speak to this morning. I commit the rest of the time to you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says? Amen. Amen. So we, as I said, we have been looking uh, through the book of Acts. It's a phenomenal book, and it, it, it chronicles the life of the early church. And uh, where we jump into this story this morning is a bunch of Jesus followers have just been presented with some information. And let's see how they kind of deal with it. So Acts chapter 15, verse 1 starts by saying, Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, there are two areas of very important context that I, I need to explain here. The first is Jewish law. So by Jewish law, if you were a Jew and you were a baby, once you hit a certain age and you were male, uh, there was a requirement for you to get circumcised. And it was really just a physical manifestation of God's covenant with the people, that God had chosen these people, that God you know, called them, um, and to set themselves apart, this was a practice that they, that they, they had to do. Right? And, and not getting circumcised as a baby would be tantamount to breaking that covenant and would be tantamount to being really, really displeasing to the Lord. Um, and so when these Judean men was, were, were telling the brothers, unless you are circumcised, etc., etc., they were not talking to a Jewish, uh, they were not talking about a Jewish audience. Because by definition, Jews would already have been circumcised once they came to a certain age. They were talking about non-Jews. And that brings me to the second area of important context that we need to get into, which is Gentiles. Now, Gentiles is just a group of people that are non-Jews. That, that's it. They're just not Jews. And what we must know is that the Jews hated the Gentiles. They absolutely hated, and, and this is not just a, a dislike or a general, it was deeply embedded and rooted in the culture as they grew up, that they, that they thought the Gentiles were sort of less than human, they're these filthy sort of, they, and there's a lot of history around this, but I thought one of the best quotes I've seen is from William Barclay. So he says this, it was common for a Jewish man to begin the day with a prayer, thanking God that he was not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. A basic part of the Jewish religion in the days of the New Testament was an oath that promised one would never help a Gentile under any circumstances, such as giving directions if they were asked. But it went even as far as refusing to help a Gentile woman at the time of her greatest need, when she was giving birth, because the result would only be to bring another Gentile into the world. It's a shocker that the Jewish people weren't the most approachable, likable, friendly people, you know, one of the great mysteries. But, but that's what it was like, the Jews and the Gentiles. And we need to understand the tension that exists when the Jews spoke about the Gentiles. So that's, that's exactly what the, um, the, these Judean men were saying when they said, you know, to all these Gentiles or about all these Gentiles, unless they are circumcised, they cannot be saved. Now, a bunch of Jesus followers, like I said, you know, Peter, Barnabas, James, Paul, etc., they did not agree. They did not agree with this position, and so they are about to bring some new information. They want to come in and say, we don't agree. And as the discussion went on, the text tells us that it became a really, really heated argument. Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with these men. This was not just a discussion. This was not just a, hey, by the way, just perhaps if you maybe want to think about, consider. This was, if you look at the original language, this was an uproar. It was an extremely, like voices were raised, there's tension in the room, it was, it was strife, you know, cheeks are getting red. No, you don't want to, do you really expect me to believe? It was at that level. 
right? And it was so heated because of that disagreement. Um, and, and what's interesting here is you have kind of a similar situation as I described just now, where both sides have information. Both sides have what they believe in. Both sides think they are right. Both sides think they are doing the godly thing. In those moments, what do you do? Right? And so they decided to themselves, you know what? Let's stop fighting. We're done here. Here's what, how we're going to resolve this. Paul and Barnabas and some of you go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. This is tantamount to us, sort of. If I, if I met you in church, we're talking about something we didn't agree, right? Back and forth. And then I say, enough, okay? I don't want to hear any more. Let's skip past, let's ask Pastor Rodden, okay? Go to the National Council of Churches, stand before the deacons and defend yourself. Okay, now go, please. I don't want to listen anymore. That was what it was. And so Paul and Barnabas were sort of sent off. And they went. Because they stood for what they believed in, they went. And so they get to Jerusalem, and some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, they rose up and they said, we agree. We agree with these Judean men. It is necessary for these Gentiles to circumcise themselves and for us to order them to keep the law of Moses. And so the Pharisees are there, the apostles and the elders were also gathered to consider this matter. Now, picture the room for a second, all right? In the one corner, you have the Pharisees, the Judean men, the apostles, the elders arguably the most educated people on the planet at the time about scripture, about God's word, about everything that you would consider accurate in terms of what God wants to say and wants to do. And then in the other corner of the room, a fisherman, some guy who sold his land, Paul, I mean, basically a bunch of uneducated, you know, wh wh whoever these outcasts are. What case could they possibly bring before this, this huge panel, right? And that's why what... That's why what happens next is so remarkable to me. Because you would have thought that the odds are stacked against them. That they would just show up there, three minutes later, it's like, this was a waste of time, everybody go home. And they, they get laughed and they leave. But what they were bringing forward caused much debate. For there to have been debate, they must have been able to hold their ground. They must have been able to, to at least provide information that made the apostles and the elders and the Pharisees and all these men sort of say, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. These, these men, right, are actually making some sense. You know, you might not be able to tell from the way they smell, but they, they, they are making some sense. So we should pay attention, everyone, we should pay attention to what they're, they're trying to say. They, they are making really good points. And so here we have, I think, a similar situation to what we described earlier, which was this. Decisions need to be made because the entire ministry of the early church hung on this issue. This wasn't just a theoretical discussion. They couldn't delete Facebook and, and stop talking about this. Do they circumcise the Gentiles or not? When they go and preach the gospel to other country, uh, nations and cities, they need to have an answer to this. So they need to find a way forward. And who has the right information? What is the right information? Because like I said, both parties were convinced they were doing the right thing. Both parties felt they were having the godly right answer. So what should guy, I, I feel like if I managed to get tickets in that room as a spectator, one of the key questions in my mind would be, what should guide us? What is going to help us get out of this mess? And so Peter stands and he says, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of God, the gospel, and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. What Peter was describing um, happened a couple of chapters earlier in Acts uh, 10, uh, which Tiffany brought us through some months back, where Peter receives a dream, um, and in that dream, God confirms that, you know what, there's no longer a Jews, Gentiles kind of split. I have chosen all these people. I have, as the verse says, made no distinction between them. And Paul, uh, Peter has an opportunity to go and speak to a room full of Gentiles. They all receive the gospel, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, just like they did on, uh, at Pentecost. Right? And so Peter was trying to tell these men, look, we, we, we saw it happen. They did not get Holy Spirit light. They got the same Holy Spirit as us. They, they didn't get the free one and we got the paid subscription. They got the whole thing, the same gospel. He made no distinction between us. And then Peter, almost summarizing, says, we believe that we will be saved. The Gentiles will be saved, not by circumcision, but through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. 
And Peter then goes on, I mean, and Peter then hands it off to his team members and Barnabas and Paul relate what signs and wonders God had already done through them among the Gentiles. It's kind of quite hard to argue with sort of real personal experience and evidence when, you know, these Gentiles that the Jews once thought were less than human, but God had already been doing a work, you know, miracles and testimonies and healing and all that stuff among the Gentiles through these group of men. And you know how the debate gets resolved? The text tells us that all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul, and whatever was being presented to them seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church. What an outstanding outcome. And let me, let me try and summarize or sort of bring this to a landing uh, this morning. Um, and we started by asking the question, what happens when you have to make actual decisions amidst a sea of information? What is the right thing to do? What, what is the right answer? How do we guide ourselves? What should we focus on to get ourselves out of this mess? I think the secret lies in the difference between these two groups of men. Group A, which was the Pharisees, the apostles, the elders, the, Jude the Judean men, and group B, Peter, Barnabas, Paul, and etc. In the first group, I think that their confidence rested in their knowledge, their education, their understanding of God's practices and rituals and laws, their information. And I think that Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and James, they didn't engage in a theological discussion. They didn't come and sort of say, hey, why don't you think about... They just said, you know what? We have been toe to toe and shoulder to shoulder with the Gentiles. And God has been doing a mighty work in them through us. In one group, information about the Gentiles. In the other group, physically with the Gentiles. And maybe the best way I'd say it is this. Perhaps God cares far less about the information. God cares far less about whether we have the right answer, whether our biblical knowledge is there, whether we, you know, we have the right scriptural context. He cares far less about us having the right answers and about settling debates on His behalf. And maybe He cares far, far, far more that we are reaching and loving and equalizing and elevating the dignity of the people that he loves, that he has placed around us. And so as I meditated on this part of scripture, the questions that kept coming to mind for me were, were these. Where have I won a debate but lost his people? Where have I focused or convinced myself that I was following his leading and his direction, but I've forgotten how to love? Where have I done the right things or said the right things, but I've done them in the wrong way? That, for me, was the question that came out from this story. It reminds me of a time in my career where I was making a, a pretty major shift, and it was, it, was a, it was a big one. I was changing teams, function, role, industry, everything. It was, it was, a, it was a massive shift, and it was a welcome one. It wasn't something that I was... I, was, I mean, I was really happy about it. Um, I had been struggling in my, in my job for a long time uh, with not feeling motivated, with doing what I considered meaningless work, um, increasingly disagreeing with business decisions that were being made, all that stuff, uh, failed promises. And so when this opportunity presented itself and kind of the new season ahead was, was, was there, um, I was really, really happy. And, and, and God allowed a lot of confirmation. Um, the way he spoke, the way he opened doors, the way he just kind of revealed the, the different steps that had to happen. I knew and I knew and I knew for a fact that this was from God. And I would argue that's probably the best kind of information one can have, the most valuable. Because if you know that God's called you somewhere and that this is the, the work or the direction that he's called you toward, that's what will get you through the dark days. That's what will get you through the challenges when they come, not if they come, but when they come. Yeah? Um, and, so, and so I had that and I was like, great, this is wonderful. But the challenge was, it was not going to be a clear cut kind of shift because I was going to have to straddle the old season and the new season simultaneously for an indefinite period of time. Essentially, I would have to be doing two jobs until I don't know when. Um, and obviously, this poses logistical challenges. You know, I've, I've had to be very aggressive with figuring out productivity improvements and, and time management and all that stuff. And in addition to that balance, you know, getting enough sleep and parenting and everything. Um, but but that, was, that was the situation. It was not going to be you know, one season to the other. And so there I was, 
thinking to myself, very similar situation. I have real decisions to make. I need to figure out what the way forward is. Who has the right answer? What is the right information? And I thought I had the answer so clearly. I thought the answer was, the new season is the focus. I need to head in that direction because that's where God has called me and that's what I need to be focusing on, right? Little did I know that the thing that I thought was going to be the greatest challenge was actually not what God wanted to do in my heart. And isn't it true that sometimes what we think is the greatest focus for our season is actually just a distraction from what God really wants to work on in your heart? In fact, uh, there was a quote that I, I love so much that captured this really well by Henry Nouwen, who is a Dutch uh, priest, theologian, and author. And he said this, he said, I used to complain about all the interruptions to my work until I realized that these interruptions were my work. And I understood this truth more than anyone else during that season. And, and so there I was thinking, you know what? I have the direction. God has called me into this. I know I'm walking through that door. And it was almost like my, there was a part of me that said good riddance to the old stuff. You know, I, it was almost like I said, out with the old, in with the new, right? You don't put new wine into old wineskins. You know, uh, uh, old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, all that stuff, right? Um, but I think it started to show up in my, in my attitude, the way I treated the job, the way I treated the old, even the old team. My, my colleagues, my co-workers, I think if I, if I dig deep enough, I probably will admit that I, I thought by being moved to this new season, I was better than that job and I was better than them. And it came out in the way that I treated people. I had no time for co-workers. It was always just like business, business. You know, I would, I would try and figure out how to be hyper-efficient. I was more curt in, my, in the emails that I sent out. Um, you know, I never had time for anybody. Um, and, and it came out in my language. You know, when someone would send me something, I would say, oh gosh, this is such a waste of time. You know, when someone would invite me for a meeting, I would say, oh, this meeting has absolutely no value. And it was my wife, Rachel, who pointed out where, with that, that this was an issue when she said to me, yeah, this meeting has no value to you. And, and, and it was true, you know, it, it was the fact that I viewed it a certain way because I convinced myself that I was heading in the right direction. I was doing what God wanted me to do. And this bled into home life. This bled into, you know, when, when there were moments where Rachel and I, my wife, were supposed to connect and I was supposed to lend a listening and a supportive ear. We were just discussing, you know, whatever it was. And I ended up being so practical about, okay, what are the options? What's the, you know, uh, can you settle this without me? Okay, please go. And then, and then it ended up being that I, I was not doing what a husband should do. And that affected things at home. When our, when our second daughter, Harper, was born, she's six months old now, when she was born, I remember feeling almost annoyed at how much work it took to raise her because that took away from the God's work that I was supposed to do. Which is funny because this is not our first child. So I should know better, because I, 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 it's, it's not a surprise that newborns are you know, as they are. Um, and I've had to go through a, a, a process of reconciling with her in my spirit to say, you know what, you need to forgive me because that's no way to treat my, my daughter. She, it's not her fault, you know, it was cruel, it was misplaced, and it was more on me than it was on anyone else. And that was what happened. And so that's why, as I was studying this passage, for, maybe the question doesn't exist for anyone else. It doesn't even matter. For me, the question was, where have I ended up feeling like I won, but I completely lost his people? Where have I convinced myself that I was following his leading and walking in his direction, but I had simply forgotten how, how to love, and I had simply forgotten what Jesus requires of us? Because it, it shows up in Scripture time and again. The second commandment is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples, right? If Jesus said if there was one defining characteristic and there's nothing else you care about, that you love one another. And that, that it shows up again and again and again, and I think that for me, I had completely lost the plot. Um, as we close this morning, I, I have a couple of other questions that I thought you know, um, were on my heart that could suggest this is something that the Holy Spirit wants to bring to, to any one of us as well. Um, when were we unable, perhaps, to extend grace towards someone? You know, when were we, did we frown upon someone else's life choices and we made a judgment about their character, we, we wrote them off when we didn't understand the full story? Because we never do. We never, let's be honest, we never ever do. Yeah. And when were we unable to genuinely feel happy for someone? You know, and, and why? When, when did someone last get upset with the way that you did or said something? Not what you, not what you did or said, not the content of it, but the way that it came across. And, and why is that? And perhaps we might find that we you know, ha have lost the real plot as well. I think to close, no one said it best um, than the Apostle Paul 
in his letter to the church in Corinth where he said, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. I gain nothing and I am nothing. That's what I learned from the story this week. Let's close uh, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the stories that you gave us. I thank you for the journey of the, the early church. I thank you for your ability to, spill, to still speak to us through these stories thousands of years later. And God, I just pray that in this moment, you would bring to remembrance for somebody tuning in today, whether online or whether in person, of where we might have lost sight of what's really important to you. Aside from what's important to us, Lord, where have we lost sight of what's important to you? How have we viewed people in a way that you wouldn't want us to view them? How have we treated people in a way that you wouldn't want us to treat them? How have we perhaps ignored the people that you have sent or you have placed in our lives for a purpose? And God, I just pray that you would stir up in our hearts your love. Teach us how to love. Teach us how to, to give and how to sacrifice as you did for us. So that we have no reason to, to boast or to hold anything about ourselves in, in greater regard than we should. Because you came to level the playing field, God. You came to equalize. Teach us how to not lord anything of, the, uh, of that nature over other people. God, I pray that as you are revealing to us how we have treated others, that you would give us the wisdom to know what that next step is, that you would give us the wisdom to know what needs to be done or said or unsaid, what relationships need to be reconciled. And I pray that you will give us the boldness and the courage to just step forth and walk in obedience. I just pray a huge blessing over every single person that has joined us today, online, from wherever they are. And I thank you for all that you've done and all that you are continuing to do in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.